Welcome to Limitless, the Blind Beginnings podcast where we discuss tips, tricks, and current topics related to all things in the blind and partially sighted community. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce the founder of Blind Beginnings and your host, Sean Marcellet, and whatever co-host is on this week. Now, here's your host, Sean. Welcome back to Limitless, the Blind Beginnings podcast. I'm your host, Sean Marcellet. I'm really excited about this week's podcast. We're doing something a little different. I don't have a co-host this week because we're actually going to share with you an interview that came about through a new program we're offering called Exploring Work Wednesdays. This is one of our online programs where each month we interview working adults who are blind or partially sighted about their employment journeys. And last week was our first session and the interview was amazing. So we got to know Mark and Lisa, who are a brother and sister. Um, They both took different paths in terms of employment and you're gonna hear all about it in this interview. So without further ado, here we go. All right, welcome to Exploring Work Wednesdays, our very first one. And I'm super excited to have Mark and Lisa, who are brother and sister and both are blind and have different jobs. Um, And I'll let them introduce themselves and tell you all about the fun things they do. But first of all, just thank you so much to both of you for being here tonight. You're welcome. So who wants to go first? We're going to back and forth this. I have a bunch of questions and I'll just sort of like, first question, tell me about yourself. Tell us about yourselves. Um, Who would like to start? My sister can. All right. (laughs) That's very gentlemanly of you. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Take it away, Lisa. Well, hi, everybody. It's super neat to hear so many people on here. Um, I grew up in Vancouver. So I was lucky I had access to uh, lots of uh, programming and lots of blind sports things and different activities where I could meet people who had the same disability as me. My career that I chose to do, well, actually what I wanted to be was a doctor. And I had parents that believed that Mark and I could do whatever we wanted. And we were exposed to a lot of things, playing tennis and golf and all these things. Uh, And unfortunately, when I got to university, I could not do medical school. Um, and though I had the prerequisites, I uh, couldn't do that. So it was a psychology professor who suggested to me um, an alternative career, and that was called medical social work. And so I liked that. So I pursued that. And I can, that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, and the eye condition that we have is called the cone rod dystrophy. Um, it was called juvenile macular degeneration years ago. Star guards. Um, fundus flavus maculatus, I think is another name. But anyway, generally they call it cone rod dystrophy. And right now I have a bit of light perception. Um, but when I started working, my visual ability was I used a, a guide dog for mobility and I could use a, a CCTV. And I had very good computer skills. Yeah. Awesome. You know what? I consider myself pretty educated about Di- uh, about different eye conditions and I didn't know that star guards and macular degenerate well I knew those two were the same but I didn't know cone rod dystrophy was considered the same eye condition so I just learned something yeah I just learned <laughs> a couple of summers ago and we were at a Stanley Park thing I was like wow really? and yeah. I also thought you guys had RP so my bad all well, right you know what? at some point they called us RP inversa right while. okay interesting all right, Mark, how about you? She gave away some of the goods, but... <laughs> she really did. She stole the good stuff. But yeah, so we got diagnosed uh, when we were nine. Uh, so myself, 53 now. Uh, my sister, 59. Um, grew up in Vancouver. And uh, the job or career or path I went on was registered massage therapy. And I got introduced to that at around 23 or 24. Uh, My dad, uh, like Lisa said, was a doctor. And he said, you ever thought of massage therapy? And I had no clue, never had a treatment, nothing. And I said to myself, wow, that could be very interesting because I'll tell you later, but for many years, I couldn't figure out how to be successful. 
and I was introduced into registered massage therapy. I loved the human body. I was at university and it was just, it was a light bulb went off. So pretty cool. And um, like Lise right now, I have a bit better vision because I'm a bit younger, um, but it is, um, how do I describe it? I wouldn't walk down the street by myself anymore. Like before I could risk it and I could follow people and I could you know, maybe bump into something. But I'd say at this point, no chance. So I have a guide dog. I've, I've had two guide dogs. Um, and so they're extremely helpful. But at this point, my vision is really, really low, about one and a half percent, I would say. Hmm. Okay. Similar to me, I think. Yeah. Uh, so you were both diagnosed when you were nine, but you're not twins. Um, was it like... Lisa was diagnosed and then they knew to look for it with Mark? Yeah, the story that, and I think Marcus, yeah, like when I was nine, they didn't, I remember at seven and eight going on family trips in cars and having all my books taken away for me, like comics and all that, because I was reading them close. Mm -hmm. And then of course the belief back then was if you read it too close, it's going to hurt your eyes, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, but then when we finally got to an ophthalmologist, it took a year for them to diagnose me because we didn't have an electroretinogram to take a picture of the back of the eye. Um, and so they really couldn't figure out what was going on. Like, was I a bratty child? Was I, you know, uh, just pretending not to see the blackboard or all this kind of stuff. Right. But anyway, eventually we were diagnosed with 10% vision when we were nine. And the, the initial investigation began because I ran across in grade two the playground and jumped into the wrong car that was parked in the same spot my mom usually parked in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and my mom's like, oops, something I don't understand. And I think for Mark, you were dropped off at soccer practice around that age and ran to the same place his team met, went, oops, that's not my team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, the, the joys of visual impairment. It's the joys, exactly. It's the first of many bloopers. <laughs> yes. When did you start thinking of a career? So for me, like in high school, I started thinking about what kind of jobs could I do as a blind person? When did you guys start thinking about a career and, and which direction did you go initially? Uh, let's go Mark first this time. Yeah, so I always knew early on I wanted to be an entrepreneur and I just couldn't figure out how to do it because my eyesight was degenerating and when I would try something the next year it would degenerate so I always had this and I'm sure everyone has this who's visually impaired uh, certainly a degenerative impairment you got this fear fear in the back of your mind um, but I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur and it was only till I got introduced to massage therapy that I said to myself this is a foundation for me to be successful. Like I can build on this and, and everything else. I just had menial jobs, um, you know, minimum wage. I cleaned restaurants. Uh, I had small little businesses with my friends, but they were just kind of unrepeatable unless I had people around me to help with my vision loss. So it, very early, I, I saw my mom, she had a variety of businesses and I just, like the idea of setting my own future, you know, figuring it out. And it was up to me to design my future. So just early on, I had that in my bones. That's cool. How about you, Lisa? I was a little bit different. I guess in high school, I was introduced to blind sports. And I had been a, a really good swimmer when I was younger, like 10, 11, 12. Um, but then when blind sports started, I was like a national swimmer suddenly. So I, instead of competing against people that were sighted, I was competing against people with my same vision. So I didn't think a lot about a career other than who I wanted to get all my pre-med done in high school. I was just so stoked on swimming and traveling around and, you know, having a good time as a teenager. I thought that was really neat. And I wanted to make sure I got all my marks to get into university. Um, and I just never thought I wouldn't, I always knew I'd be working in medicine in some way. Um, so, but I did really have to accommodate my vision and I thought, well, if I got into social work, I thought, well, that'd be okay. 
but it wasn't really enough for me. So I want to be in the hospital. So I thought, okay, well, medical social worker. Okay, good. Because I was really interested. Same as Mark and anatomy and biology and all this stuff. Um, but I was really interested in the human experience, right? And the, what keeps people going and that kind of thing after illness. So, um, yeah. So I basically uh, took a couple of years of psychology and then I switched over to do my social work degree. So let's talk about yeah, and then, and it, how much school do you need to do medical or psych psychiatric social yeah. work? Uh, it's a long time. It's six years. So you need four years as an undergrad. And then you need to go out and work for two years in the field. And then you come back and do a two-year master's. And what about you, Mark? To be an RMT, what, uh, what kind of schooling? Uh, two years. So you take it through private colleges. They have it. Well, Langara has it a public institution, but the other colleges are all private. So it's, I mean, what I actually say to people uh, who are visually impaired is like, you, you can't believe if this is what you like, if you like the human body, if you like interacting and engaging and um, working with people, you can't believe in two years how you can come out and be fully working, making $75,000. Like it's, it's mind boggling what it allows a blind person to do. Mm, wow. Okay. You're really plug in. That's me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there's other levels of social work too. You don't have to get a graduate degree. Like you can get diplomas you can get certificates. If you like to work with people in, in a social work way, kind of looking at the system they live in and, the community and some of them they go from six months right up so there's lots of different opportunities along the way yeah. mm -hmm. what skills helped you guys get through university or post-secondary like what of your own personal skills do you think were really essential in helping you get that done uh let's go mark first i would say the main thing is for me i always knew i would never give up and I sucked in school. Like I sucked so bad. I took woodworking 11 twice. <laughs> that, that's how much I sucked. Um, but I always knew that I was on the right path, meaning that I was good working with people. I was always curious. I wanted to learn. I couldn't figure out how to learn. Like my lease is just far more, dedicated than I ever was in that regard. And, and looking back on it, it was kind of funny how pathetic I was, but the fact that I was resilient and was always building resiliency really paid off as I started to pick up speed. So the skill set was being able to deal with people, find strengths in them because well, I think anybody in life, but for blind people, you need a team around you. Like, even if you're just calling an Uber, you know, if you get a nice Uber driver that comes out and helps you in the car, it makes it that much easier. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm very uh, aware of figuring out how to work with people and understanding their strengths and, and resiliency. Those, those would be my two greatest skills. I like it. I was big smiles over here with the never give up. <laughs> yeah, you never give up. It's, yeah. you, you can never give up. It's not an opportunity. Yeah. How about you, Lisa? That too. I mean, just that sense that you never do give up. Um, and we were really taught that with our parents, particularly our mom. And I remember, you know, playing tennis with her when I could see a little better when I was younger. And then, you know, you couldn't see the ball very much. Oh, that's okay. She says, I'll serve it to you. And you get two bounces. That's fine. Next six months, next year, I'll serve it to you. Now you get three bounces. Finally, I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off, right? And I'm like, Mom, I don't think this is, her. you know, no. Yeah. And then, no, oh, no, you can serve it to me. Oh, my God. So we were taught at a very young age, like, you don't give up. Just, you can always do what you want, but you may have to do it differently, right? Yes. Uh, and absolutely, like that whole idea of being resilient and the one gift that going blind or being blind in a sighted world gives you is life gives us so many opportunities to get knocked down. Everybody gets those, but being blind seems to get us extra ones. And yeah, just to keep getting up and figuring it out and does make you resilient. 
absolutely. And not to quit and to be curious mm -hmm. and absolutely to uh, work in relationship with people. Love yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about what accommodations do you need or did you need in your jobs? Um, Lisa first. I'm saying did oh. because I think you're retired, right? I am retired. Well, I'm back in private practice. So. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> I'm retired, but yeah, I'm back. So yeah, so basically my career, when I, I, I went right through school, um, and during my six years in school, um, we did placements, and I would really recommend that to anybody, but particularly to those of us who are, aren't the average student um, in a workplace, because it gives people an opportunity to get to know who you are. Um, and not just that your name is on a piece of paper being blind with them having their own idea about what that is. Um, and so basically, yeah, my first job I got uh, through a vocational rehab program, which we used to run in the province, which helped people with disabilities. And so that was really cool. And then once I got into my job job, um, I got all my jobs through placement. So from knowing people and being in a relationship with the people, them seeing my work, us working out, you know, if there was any little glitchy things of how I would talk to someone or how I'd tell them I was blind because I didn't want to tell anybody when I was young and all these kinds of things. But it was all through that kind of interpersonal, you know, kind of work. So basically all my jobs, yeah, went from my placements or by word of mouth through, you know, uh, networking, but it was all through working in those, some people call them co-ops. Is that what they call them now? Or in mm -hmm. internships? I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. I'd really encourage you to get into a program like that um, because that's really powerful. And I, I have a short story. Mark and I were just talking before and he thought I should share it um, because I worked in a, in a large health authority. So I worked in uh, Fraser Health authority i started when it was a very small hospital and it was a wonderful place to work and a wonderful place to work for all of us and we all knew each other we could all you know we were all in relationship with each other once we got to be a big health authority things changed quite a bit for me i was the only blind person in the fraser health authority working at the level that i worked at um and there was all these rules that had a duty to accommodate me which meant you know they have to make things work for me as a blind person um, and that's really good in theory, I must say, but it worked really well for me and it was swimming along. I thought, this is really kind of cool. Then in came a new lady who was like your boss uh, at work. She, her personal belief was that she'd never met anyone who was blind, nor did she believe that a blind person could work at the level I was. So although I was doing the job and continue to do the job after she left, she made my, I was vulnerable by her coming into that position uh, because it was such a large um, workplace. You know, I, I don't know now whether I, I think I would recommend to, to stay in a smaller workplace with a smaller team of people because the big, it was neat. Like you got good pensions and good money and things like that. But boy, when the players changed and your relationships changed, moved around, it over and over again made me quite vulnerable. Hmm. Yeah, in a setting which I didn't expect to feel because I thought I chose this great career um, and I didn't really need vision for it or I could accommodate myself through losing my vision. Um, so one of the things I would hate any of you to get on is that that race that I had to be better than everybody else in the workplace because I didn't, I guess, accept myself going blind. I think yeah. that's what it was deep down. And I just single-handedly exhausted myself. Yeah. yeah, I totally understand what you're saying. But yeah, I, I thought, yeah, it's a hard one. That's like the need to overcompensate for the fact that you're blind. So I better be better than everyone else just so that they'll see me as equal. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I, I can relate. <laughs> By the time you're like in your 40s, it's just great because you know you don't have to do that anymore. But those 20s and 30s are so hard. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, staff, lots of staff changes. And then all over again, people are getting like, oh, there's a blind person here. And then all the educating that goes with that, like over and over and over and having to prove yourself. Over and over and over. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The other big change came when, when I went into social work 
um, we had a dictation system. So all of our uh, recording, not recording, sorry, charting. So you write in all your notes in the medical chart. You don't have to go to the hospital. You have this little chart. So, um, and that was great. So we did all this medical dictation and all of our notes over the telephone. And then the Fraser Health Authority decided, I guess, about five years in that they were going to get rid of all the secretaries and all the data entry people and that all the professionals were going to be doing their own entry. Right. Which is fine, but that's pretty hard for me because I had to keep a template on my um, computer that looked the same as everybody else's because they did it a different way. And then a new law, a new rule came in that I couldn't keep anything on my C drive. Mm -hmm. But being a rebel that I am, I just kept it on my C drive because I knew I couldn't do it the other way. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, the, very, out, yeah the, what's that? Filling out forms when, yeah. when it's like confidential private information gets a little sticky, right? It's a bit sticky, yeah. And they worked it out in kind of really weird ways. You know, you have to be a real creative problem solver. One of the creative solutions that came up in the hospital is that I could use a volunteer to read the medical charts, which I really wasn't comfortable with at all. And I had access to really intimate information about people. Mm -hmm. And for a while I had to do that. And I, I, that really was difficult. I didn't like that. But you do have to be creative problem solver. You have to have a really good sense of humor, have a good laugh at yourself all the time. Be mm -hmm. constantly curious about how can I make this work? Yeah. And even say to people, hey, how are we going to work this out together? Now, that's mm -hmm. a very fair question. Because you could say, like, I would say now, it, at my age, I would say, hey, you know what? I've never seen this little, and I really want to do this, and you'd really like me to do this. So how are we going to work it out? Because I don't know how to do it at this vision level, right? Mm -hmm. And once you open up that dialogue and be in a relationship with people, then suddenly they go, oh, maybe this, maybe that, and and it works out pretty well yeah. but being vulnerable is hard when you're 20 and 30 it's super hard yeah and trying to live and grow up and lose your vision yeah. mm -hmm. uh what about you mark what like i know that the massage therapy training is really intensive and uh, you know you gotta like probably label diagrams and <laughs> learn all the muscles and bones and tendons and all that stuff like and like how was that for you what accommodations did you need yeah uh, I mean it was incredibly challenging but the good thing about it is is I loved it so I just had to figure it out like how would I label it and I mean back in the day that was 20 god knows what years ago um, 25 years ago um, and, and I guess less, pe less blind people around, it was open for me to figure it out like Lisa had talked about, is that I just had an open conversation and told them what I could do and what I couldn't do. And I had a government, and I can't remember the government program, I think it's still around, it's called, uh, whatever it's called, um, Government Program A. And they supplied me with a tutor for my academics and a tutor for my um, practical. And they were really, really helpful because I could relate to them intimately because they worked with me closely and they could, they could see what I could and couldn't do. Because the other problem, and I think people face this, is at least for Lisa and I, Growing up, we didn't look blind in any way. We just waltzed around, did whatever. Even if you whip out a cane, people, uh, I remember someone telling me they thought it was something to, to um, like a Geiger counter for the concrete. They're like, what are you doing with that? Are you testing the cement? And I remember like, what? <laughs> this is a blind cane. Like, what are you talking about, right? So it, it was a bit challenging in that people didn't appreciate how little you could see but I was very appreciative of the support I had and and how they could see that I needed these accommodations. And the school was very helpful because it was very small. I mean, the school had, I don't know, 250 students. And so um, they were very helpful. And I was also very appreciative. 
And th that's the other thing I'd like to sort of mention is that, yeah, there's all this accommodation, but if you're always going out there to say, what are you gonna do for me? What are you gonna do for me? It feels better to say, hey, like Lisa said, I really wanna do this. I'm really excited. This is my dream. How can we make this work together? And it really helped through school. Like it really, really did help. And then when you get out, um, the good thing is you typically now have these software programs and they're about 90% accessible. So basically the, the position is very accessible. Um, you still have to ask a few questions. Like I have a couple of blind people working in my business. And so, you know, they still have to ask questions because the software is not perfect but it works very well. So accommodation wise, it is a great career um, for you to have that independence and be able to grow if you have degenerative disease. Because that, that's the key, as things go away, you gotta figure out how to solve the problem. Did you go straight from school to starting your own clinic or did you work for someone else first? Uh, I did a locum for about five months okay. and then I just instantly started up my first business and then I went through about seven businesses in about 10, 15 years there and then I figured out, I aligned all my failures and got them to sort of go my way now and started the, uh, the path to a, a successful um, business and and I quit practicing about 10 years ago now you just have people working for you yeah because that's why I got into it like I didn't get into it to be a miracle therapist I got into massage therapy because I needed something to base my vision loss on and like Lisa mentioned it's being 20 and vulnerable you know you, you just want to fit in and you just want to make it work and Everywhere I turned, I couldn't make it work and I couldn't fit in. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I was definitely social, engaged and had great friends, but I couldn't get a job. Like, yeah. it was just, it was awful. And then I found massage therapy and I was like, regardless of my vision loss, when someone says you're blind and you're a massage therapist, suddenly they think you're superhuman. <laughs> and it's it works to your advantage. They're like, oh my God, this blind guy worked on me. And I, I would get these referrals. And it was always because I was blind. And I, I just remember early on going, this is awesome. Like, I, I don't need to make up excuses for my blindness. I need to now celebrate it. <laughs> so for me, I just loved it, but I knew I had to get into entrepreneurship. So I knew my path was going um, with it. Um, and it was a great resource for me to get to entrepreneurship. When I look back now, like, so I did my graduate work and wrote a thesis and defended my thesis and we had no computers. And um, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's absolutely <laughs> crazy. And I think of the teams of people, one of the skill sets I developed very well was how to interact with people. Um, and, and then I just had teams of readers reading and reading and reading. And there used to be a thing at UBC called the Crane Library, and they taped books. Mm -hmm. I hope they're still around. And they were amazing. They had two visual texts there, which was low, the CCTVs. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, definitely, man, hours of being read to. Yeah. So you just typed your notes, your papers and stuff on a typewriter? Yep. The old, I hate to say it, makes me sound old, but the old IBM Selectrix. Yep. We had <laughs> with the white thing. <laughs> and then for... For my grad work, I had to hire somebody who had a word processor to type it up. Wow. Could you see what you were typing? No. Like if you made a mistake? So you'd have to just hold that all in your head and yeah. know exactly from beginning to end, kind of for that page, what you wanted to type. Exactly. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I would put it under the visual tag, the CCTV, and double check it. And then that just became incredibly laborious. Um, wow crazy that yep. I can't imagine. I mean, I reread and reread everything I write so many times that, you know, <laughs> and we have spell no. check and <laughs> all those things now. But certainly going back. Um, so I did retire. Um, 
and Mark and I were talking about this earlier, how many people we know that went through and worked for very, very large corporations, you know, banks, the government and that, and they're really keen to accommodate you or, or you know, they think you're amazing, right? Oh, this blind person does this, this blind person does that. But around 50 people, they're not quite so keen to accommodate you. And they're really happy to kind of put you onto pasture on disability. Mm. And, uh, and it, it's a difficult transition and, and it's for each of us a very personal decision. How much do you want to fight that to stay working? Because yes, they do have to accommodate us and help our work, our work continue. Um, certainly the best thing I ever did was step out of that. I went on long-term disability for a number of years and then about five years ago I came off it and I started a private practice um, and I'm working for myself and it's been a fantastic transition because I can accommodate myself. Yeah. So what do you love most about your job? And maybe we'll go with your current like private practice and running your clinic, being your own boss. What do you love most? Uh, Lisa. I love people. I love the power of the human spirit, the sense of curiosity. I love that uh, ability to plant seeds in people and watch them grow. I love to mentor them. Um, yeah, I just love that being in a relationship with people and just helping them discover who they are and, and watch them grow and change and flourish. And I think that's what I loved about my career as well. And in psychiatry, I mean, it was a real gift to be involved in people at that level of vulnerability for them and to work with their families and get discharge plans of how they're going to make it when they get out. And, uh, yeah, that kind of stuff. I loved it. I just, cause I love working with people. I love the freedom. Mm -hmm. So I love the fact that I do what I want, when I want, where I want. Um, everything is up to me to, to create. And if I don't create it, I'm responsible for it. No one else. I don't blame anybody. Uh, it, if I don't do it, it's, it's my problem. And so just, yeah, the ability to know your future is just fun. Uh, it does come with stress for sure, but it's a stress I like and, and I move towards that stress. So that's, that's, and I mean, ultimately with that freedom, um, like I said before, it's building a team. So I have a company of 60 people now. So I have people that help me in many different areas. And for me, like I said earlier, teamwork is everything. So the fact that I can be free and have a team is like the best of both worlds. I'm a very avid skier and I, I teach skiing and we coach in that. And it's the same idea if we want to go hiking or we want to do stuff as blind people, we then surround ourselves with a team of people that can enable us to do that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the same skill set. Mm -hmm. As you develop that um, growing up that you can take directly into the workplace. Um, maybe tell us about your company, Mark, because I had no idea it was that big. So what, tell, like 60 people, like they're not all massage therapists, I'm guessing. No, we got uh, 45 therapists and 15, uh, say, um, staff, so receptionists, um, administrators, that type of thing. Wow. Uh, so 15 of them, but 45 therapists, the, the biggest area is massage therapy and I think we got about 23, got about six physios, um, some uh, three or four acupuncturists, chiros, psychiatry counselors, oh, wow. uh, physiologists, um, naturopath. Uh, so yeah, we, we cover a lot of health services. Um, That's awesome. And you've hired yeah. some blind people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I got a a buddy of mine, so I'm really into blind ice hockey, a, a buddy that I met through blind ice hockey, he saw what I was doing and he got into it. And so, yeah, he actually works at my clinic now. Um, cool. But I've had other blind people uh, also working there. Um, so, yeah, it, it's awesome because it's one thing that I do it myself and I created what I have created, but it's pretty cool to see other blind people because they're like you, you know, they're like, Hey man, I get this person, you know, we've gone through these struggles and now they're being successful. Yeah. And it's fun. It, it is just, it's downright enjoyable to be able to have that level of connection with a group of people that really know you. Yes. 
So yeah. I, I'm curious if you guys uh, think that you excel in some ways at your job because of your blindness. Yeah, I think so. Because I think you learn to be successful. You learn to excel in life. And there's so many skill sets involved in that. And I think that that's that drive and that curiosity and always asking questions. And so definitely you can't be successful and a blind person and not be driven mm -hmm. to a certain extent to be curious and engaged. Um, yeah, that's a good thing. That's a good yeah. quote. <laughs> you can't be yeah, I don't know what a blind it was. person and not be driven. I think you're right. Yeah. 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 And but, the other thing is that I worked for nine psychiatrists and after about, I guess I was in my thirties, 35, uh, nobody wanted to work on a Lux like unit. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Cause what intrigued me was there was 12 beds only. And I'm like, that'd be way better than the 60 beds I'm running around now trying to do. Um, and a lot of psychiatric notes when you read them are like 60 year old unkempt man looking older than his stated age which to everyone on this call means very little yeah but to sighted psychiatrists it said everything and so none of my reports would be like that it was all more psychosocial stuff and that and they came and they said wow it's amazing how much information you get out of our patients and I said, it's maybe it's just a different trust level you start at. But I said, it doesn't matter to me. I can't look at them and make all those judgments before I talk to them. Yes. I can't do that whole thought process, right? Yes. Yeah. So you had to, I mean, you're not making any assumptions about them based on their appearance either. You got to figure it out, find out. You got to figure it out and ask questions and check it out and go, you know, do I understand this correctly? you know mm -hmm. yeah yeah so asking questions good questions is a great skill to practice your whole life yeah mm -hmm. what do you uh what about you mark do you feel like in what ways do you feel like you are maybe better at your job because of your blindness i, I think like lisa said it's the drive it's the passion uh i think the blindness certainly helped because it got us on a path that you can't get out of. Um, hopefully one day we will. <laughs> but uh, it, in the last 44 years, there doesn't seem to be an answer right now. Um, so that certainly started us on the, on the, I mean, the right path. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the right path, but it certainly is the path that created an amazing life. Um, but I think the one thing that overrode everything, and, and my sister mentioned it before, um, was our mom. Uh, she just dealt with us like we had a visual impairment, but we were just like everybody else. And the one thing Lisa didn't sort of say in that tennis example is my mom would easily beat us in the tennis match and be very happy. And, <laughs> and, and she would say, well, you know, Mark, it bounced twice. You just missed it. And, and then she <laughs> yeah, would go, the, yeah, and she'd go the third bounce. But she would never let us win because we were blind. Right. Everything we got in life is because we did it and we deserved it. And that really imprinted in me at a very early age that if my mom trusts us to be the people we are going to be in life and fulfill our dreams, then, then it's in my heart forever. And that's mm -hmm. just the way I see life, that I am going to fulfill all the dreams I have. Um, mm -hmm. on one level, yeah, it's brutal. We're going blind. I mean, we're basically blind, but on another level, look at what it's given us. And, mm -hmm. and I, I really, my mom, our mom, I got to give her mm -hmm. the majority of the kudos because she taught us many valuable lessons and I, I would not have what I have if she was not in my life. Oh, absolutely. Let's talk about disclosure. So Lisa, you mentioned you didn't really want anybody to know. I definitely went through that uh, in my 20s as well until I couldn't really fake it anymore. Um, <laughs> so how- I in, hate that point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how did you, how did you tell people? When did you tell people? What was your process in the workplace? It varied by the people, right? I'm, I really like to listen to people 
and kind of get in touch with kind of what they're saying, how they're reacting to me. And really the way they reacted to me or the way we interacted um, sadly influenced my process. Like I didn't have confidence in one process that I would have if somebody was giving me all these judgments um, about myself, not about myself, but of, you know, people that were not able, or they had a lot of judgments say about patients as opposed to staff as if we're different, you know, human beings, mm. I would be less likely to disclose that much to those people. I always used to seeing eye dog at work. Um, so I figured out, I figured that maybe that would describe certain things to people and they would get a sense that I couldn't see mm. as you know, very well, but it never did. You walk really? around to see, I talk all over the place with Ted Gaines. And if you looked confident and you probably went through this two shot and you move confidently and, and you're dressed like, I don't know, coordinated or something, and you're looking around, then they don't get that you can't see. Yeah. Um, and, and you do, like Mark was saying, like, you do try to say, no, I really can't see very well. Um, I make eye contact and that really confuses people. But that was another thing my mom kind of taught us to do. So the disclosure thing, I think for me, it started when I got to trust somebody or had a friend say at work and I'd kind of go, yeah, I really don't see as much as you think I see would, would usually you be, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes as the condition advanced, um, I, you don't really know what you don't see, if that makes sense, right? So you're yes. not really quite sure. And so you're kind of going, I don't really get this. Like I never used to bang into that wall before. I, yes. I never really, yeah, couldn't figure out the buttons on the elevator. So like, why did that change? And how am I going to make that work? And all these weird things, because it's new for us too. We're kind of thinking, I don't know. <laughs> so the whole disclosure thing, it's kind of, yeah, it was a tough one. And then at a certain point when you can't fake it anymore, you do just kind of have to say, hey, you know what? Uh, this is the gig, you know? Yes, I use this dog because I can't see very much. Yes, when I move around, it does look like I can see because, you know, I've done lots of sports. I continue to do yoga. You know, I'm, I'm physically fit. I do a lot of hiking. Um, so, yeah, it does look because I move around confidently. But I would often say to them, hey, if I'm in an unfamiliar environment, I look like a really different person <laughs> yeah. because I've got my hand out in front of me. I'm not quite sure what the shadows mean. Um, that kind of thing. So the disclosure is a very personal thing. But yeah, like you said, Sean, it's you fake it till you can't. Right. I think Mark do the same thing because we you want to belong, right? You want to belong. Mm -hmm. And be seen as the same. Yeah, I I would say that definitely what she's chatting about. Um the fact that you're used to your environment, and so when you're used to your environment, like Lisa said, you really don't know what you see or can't see because you're used to it. So you just do things automatically. And it's definitely when I go somewhere new, I'm as blind as a bat. Like, <laughs> it's hysterical how blind I am. I mean, it's kind of weird saying that with 1.5% of vision, but I think <laughs> as blind people, we kind of get it. Yes. Yeah. You always think you can see. Um, but yeah, it's a new environment then I let people know. The one thing that I really helped me was when I got my first guide dog, uh, it really loosened the sort of tension I had in my body about always explaining to people what you can and cannot see because they'd be like, can you see this? Can you see my fingers? Can you? It's like, oh God, you're boring me. Like, it's so <laughs> irritating. So the guide dog helped me at the beginning um, to just sort of go, whoa, man, this dude, I guess, doesn't see. And I really like that. But as you get used to having a guide dog, like Lisa said, you could have a guide dog, 10 canes. And I remember I had a conversation with this guy at dinner for 45 minutes on a patio with my dog, clearly right there beside me. And then about 30 minutes into it, he goes, you know, man, what is up with your dog? Like, that's a terrible brace he's got. <laughs> and her eyes is like, whoa, man, like again, like how clueless can you be? And I didn't even make reference because I do a lot of Tony Robbins events. So I was at a Tony Robbins event and it was it's pretty clear that I'm the blind guy around. And I was just shocked. And so even when you're used to things, you become just really good at working in your environment. And so 
Yeah. yeah. People have trouble understanding that you should be so capable with what, what quote unquote, what should be a wickedly incapable disease. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I would sparingly introduce it into my, into my life and only use it, like Lisa said, after you could read people and understood kind of what that meant to introduce it. I mean, of course, if I'm crossing the street and I'm on my guide dog or cane, I'm, I'm holding on to someone or I'm walking directly behind them mm -hmm. and making sure I know where, I, where I'm going. But it, it is an interesting concept because for decades, you just want to fit in. Like, you just want to be like everybody else. So I fought it for a long, long time. So I work as a counselor in, in private practice too. And, and the, you know, when I started there, the team was kind of like, well, what should we tell people when we book an appointment with them? You know, about your mm -hmm. vision and I was kind of like oh it didn't even occur to me that we would tell them anything like why do we need to warn them that I'm blind um I sort of came around to being okay with it right. like maybe they do have a right to know especially if they're coming in for counseling and if that's going to throw them off or make them really uncomfortable you know maybe I'm not the best counselor so just curious did did your patients know in advance? Did you know, I, just so you know, I have a guide dog or I'm blind, yeah. like would any of that be going on? Yeah, so I guess the good thing yeah. is when I got a guide dog, I was already well into owning my own businesses. So it was my way or the highway. And right. so Victor sat at the front desk and he was the most loving dog. And, and 99.9% .9 of people would go, oh, my God, what a pooch. And they'd come over and they'd pet him <laughs> and they'd go, hey, this is the best place. Who owns the dog? And they'd say, well, actually, Mark, he's this guide dog. And they'd say, I've got to meet him. And they'd be like, no problem. You're seeing him in about five minutes. <laughs> so it, it was a huge advantage to having such a loving dog. Now, as I say, 0 0.01 people would come around the corner and go, whoa. And, and jump back, but so be it. Like, I, I only need to appeal to a, a certain percentage of people that like me and, and like animals. And so at our clinic, we're very animal friendly. So other people bring their dogs in and it's, it's just what I made it to be. I made it to be successful as opposed to um, um, an issue. But, but I did have the luxury of, of writing my own rules. Yeah. I had a similar experience to you, Sean, is like people saying, well, what should we tell patients when they got to come down to your office? You know, they're going to see your guide dog and that. And, and I, I had the same reaction. I was like, well, what are you going to tell them? Like that I've got blonde hair or like, what's the point if, you know? Yeah. But then I did also think, well, yeah, maybe they, they have a right to know um, because I kind of yeah, but I remember an experience in, in social work school where you have to do these little video things when you start uh, school about therapy and psychoeducate stuff. And, uh, and we did this little video thing and the teacher was sitting down and he says, okay, Lisa, it's your turn. I walk up there with my dog. I sit in the chair and he goes, man, nobody told me I was going to see a blind social worker. And I just went, holy crap. And I was suddenly, I could hardly speak. I was so intimidated. Mm. And that's, and I never even said back to him, like, why does that matter so much? Yeah. Um, because it has, it, it's been my experience. I'm not sure about you, Shaw, but it, it's a very different connection you get with people when they know you're vulnerable and, and you are out there doing your thing. It's, uh, it's been an asset, very much an asset in a counseling environment, I'd say. Yeah, it has. And it's now the very first thing I talk about with every new client and it's the way I break the ice and it sort of, yeah, makes people, I mean, maybe there's some people that won't come back after that first session because they are uncomfortable, yeah. but I haven't really had that experience so far. So, but yeah, it's an, it's always an interesting yeah. question. Good. We Cheerio that we don't want to have the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But yeah. I, but I guess my advice to people on the call would be, um, be confident when you tell people like you're no less a person for having, you know, for being blind. It's just something we all live with and makes us stronger. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And so sometimes that pressure, like, hey, you got to tell people all this stuff. Really, you don't need to. Yeah. You know, you are who you are and you get to disclose what you want about yourself. Like whether you like blue shoes or a pink tie or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the more sort of um, relaxed you are in when you disclose, the more relaxed they'll be too, right? So if you make it really medical and scientific and emotional, then they will too. (laughs) <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah just the more chilled you can be they'll be chilled and reacting yeah yeah um i wanted to you kind of touched on this a little bit but is there anything else your parents did that really helped you be successful in your career yeah i, I would say again she, yeah she never let us i mean I, I would say win um so i said that before so we if we won we won because we beat her the other thing was like lisa said she was very encouraging so Mm -hmm. it didn't matter if you wanted like i remember um i wanted to ride my my motocross bike which is just um a pedal bike but back then they called them or bmx's that's what they called them motocross Mm -hmm. bmx's Mm -hmm. and i remember my mom going oh my god that sounds outrageous and what we did we we'd launch we'd do a ramp on a bench and we'd launch yourself over 10 garbage cans and i mean ridiculous idea for just any young man or woman to do that in the back alley of your house but when you're visually impaired and can't figure out distances and can't really get to the ramp i remember my mom just she she wasn't like what did you do today she was just like really well how did it work out (laughs) as opposed to saying i couldn't do stuff it was always like, well, just go do it and we're gonna figure it out. And, and that ability to figure stuff out is why I do what I do, because yeah. I love figuring things out with other people. And it doesn't yeah. matter if I'm in a BMX bike or if I'm helping a massage therapist or a patient or, or anybody else or, or people on this call, other fellow blind people. Mm-hmm. It's just, I love the ability to figure things out with other people. So she really instilled that into you. Problem solving. Yeah. Problem solving. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other thing is we were lucky enough to grow up with privilege, right? Like we grew up on the West side. Our mom was a stay at home mom for the majority, you know, of our lives. Our dad worked, um, But also in that scenario, I mean, they did get divorced when we were, you know, pretty young. And so then you kind of fight through that as well. Um, But yeah, definitely your parents are, both our parents were very, very strong, but mom particularly. Yeah. Sounds like there was an expectation, which I feel just my own sort of research and experience in life is that if your expect, if your parents expect expect you to be successful you're far more likely to be right so if there's an expectation that you're not going to be expectation we wouldn't be successful it was just kind of be yeah what would it be in Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and how we make that happen and how would we maintain that and 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 she's yeah and she's still just like that she's very driven and very creative problem solver and you know, I remember, I don't know, cooking or what, it doesn't matter really what it is. She's like, oh, don't worry if you can't see it, you can smell it. Oh, don't yeah. worry if you can't see it, you can touch it until when it's crusty, that kind of thing. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so it doesn't always need to be your mom or your dad, but if you can surround yourself with able minded people, if that makes sense, like also very positive people that just figure it out with you, then it's actually, it's a journey we all, like Mark was saying, we're on right now. And, you know, there is no cure. So we Mm. might as well surround ourselves with kind of can do people because it makes the journey a lot more enjoyable. I love that. It's like no excuse. Like blindness was not going to be an excuse out of anything because there was always another way and she could see that. And so she made you see that. I love that. Yeah. That's what No, no, you're never going to live. She's a neat neat woman and we're lucky enough to still have her. Oh, that's cool. I want to meet her. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You would never limit yourself. That's true. <laughs> so if you could give advice to your younger self uh, about career, what would that advice be? I would say go after what your passion is. 
do not get a job because you think you're blind and this job is going to pay you money and because you're blind you should lower your expectations to realize your dreams uh, your dreams will never be realized through accommodating your vision they'll be realized through fighting and driving yourself to the point of exhaustion failure like just the worst thing you'll think you're in and then suddenly it'll be like whoa man blue sky is ahead and how cool is this and whatever that is we in our society now think that financial success is important it's the least important you need personal fulfillment you need passion you need to drive yourself for what it means in your heart not in your head so as a younger person i got very caught up in how to figure it out and i was very good at it but i did um do one thing that i sh people should know um i spent many decades drinking to excess to deal with my pain of loss and i would certainly say to myself as a younger person I would have shortened that up by a couple decades <laughs> because <laughs> I was always on the right path of following my passion. I just thought it would come quicker. And for me, it didn't. For me, it took quite a long time, but it's not the destination, it's the journey that I realized is what you're on. And so don't drive for the destination really, really work for the journey because that's what gives you fulfillment. Yeah. Well said. Awesome. Well said. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, find out what you're passionate about, what you love to do. And if you're not sure, go around and ask people to shadow them. Um, while I was working, I, I taught for University of BC in the UVic, and then we also had University College of the Fraser Valley. And so I mentored uh, social workers and they would come work for some for four months one day a week or two days a week. Um, but even just as friends, you know, or if you have jobs, you know, I, know, I think in grade nine, they have take your kid to work day. Mm -hmm. There's lots of people, if you think in your life that you might want to be what they are, um, talk to them and see. Because yeah. it's it, our minds are what limits us. Yeah. If we limit ourselves, then when then we're limited, but certainly it sounds a bit cheesy, but I, I think that's absolutely true in the long run. And if you do find your passion and do ride the journey. And for myself, what I would say to myself is I would have cut myself a lot more slack. I was super, super hard on myself to be the perfect mom and the perfect social worker and have the perfect life and the perfect wife and the perfect house. And I was, I'd cut myself a ton more slack. Well, thanks again, you guys. This was fabulous. Really interesting. Mark, I want to talk to you about Tony Robbins training at some point. <laughs> sure. you, I can tell by the way you speak that you've got that in you. So I'm sure. Exactly. <laughs> Rock is speaking for him. Yeah, really good. Yeah, it's awesome. No, super great. Thank you so much. I learned a lot and I'm sure everybody else did. So thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you so you're much. Welcome. Okay, you're welcome. welcome. Yeah. Okay. I hope you all enjoyed this interview as much as I did. I learned so much. We had a lot of great questions following my interview. And um, I'm just so grateful to Mark and Lisa for being with us and sharing so openly and really real about, about their journeys and about their blindness. Thanks again, Mark and Lisa. And I hope you all will join us again next time for Limitless. For more information on Blind Beginnings and its mission to inspire and support children and youth who are blind or partially sighted and their families, visit www.blindbeginnings.ca.